Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's event, Privacy and Data Protection and e-Discovery. Your first presenter today is Mary Mack. Mary, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, welcome to Privacy and Data Protection and eDiscovery. We are at Zyleb are thrilled to have Ken Rashbaum and Jan Schultes uh, presenting these topics uh, to us. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's happening today. Uh, there are many developments in both U.S. and international uh, privacy and data protection. We're uh, we're going to talk about admissibility, which is a topic that many of the uh, many of the present presentations don't go so far as to talk about the admissibility of uh, evidence. And then we're going to end up with some very practical techniques on how to use technology to find protected data uh, in reviews and in information management. Your questions are welcome if you'll uh, type them into the chat window, and I will insert them into the dialogue uh, in the appropriate place. So Ken, I'd like to introduce my friend Ken Rashbaum. He is the founder of Rashbaum Associates. Prior to that, he was the eDiscovery partner and founded the HIPAA practice at Sedgwick Dieter. He former ADA, and he labors in Sedona Working Group 6 as well as Working Group 1. He is a moving force in the ABA International towards getting some harmonization and some sensitivity in the United States to international privacy concerns. And he's re recently written an, uh, a law review article on the admissibility of international electronic evidence. Jan Schultes is our, is our own chairman and chief strategy officer at Xilab. He's been involved in deploying in-house e-discovery for uh, oh, decades, uh, including at the UN War Crimes Tribunal uh, back in the day for the FBI Enron, uh, and he was instrumental in solving some of the email problems in the executive office of the president and the White House. And uh, uh, he is the extraordinary chair in text mining in the Department of Knowledge Engineering at the University of Maastricht. Ken? Right. Thank you, Mary. Uh, we're going to talk about the four what I call hot issues in electronic information management and discovery. And you're going to hear me refer to information management and governance and e-discovery in similar veins because they really are intertwined. Any organization that has put its information management and information governance protocols in good order and updated them will have a very easy time with e-discovery. And the converse uh, is also is also true. If you don't have your information management protocols together, where your data may be, who has access to them, how easy or difficult is it to transfer data from place to place, what are the laws and regulations surrounding transfers of those data, it's going to be very difficult to comply with court orders, arbitration requests, or uh, government investigations, or even internal investigations, for why you need uh, your organization, uh, why you need your information. So, we're going to be talking about cybersecurity. A, it's in the news considerably, and B, we're going to uh, also be talking about how cybersecurity precautions and safeguards can help you with using the electronic information that you get when you're in uh, foreign uh, arbitration or, or litigation. Healthcare is also a very, very hot issue uh, for reasons which we'll get to, uh, but you should know at this point that in the United States, uh, by 2015, according to government mandate, all health information will be electronic, which means that for care purposes, for patient safety purposes, government investigations, litigation, your information discovery in healthcare will be electronic, and healthcare is very challenged at this point in organizing its electronic information. The third aspect is international. The European Union is undergoing a major renovation of the European Union Privacy Directives, fast-tracked to be completed by this year. 
um, the rest of the world with, outside the United States takes its cues to a great extent on information privacy and uh, data protection from the European Union. And finally, we're going to talk about admissibility of electronic information. Now, for those of you who may feel you, may, you want to tune out at that section, don't. For one thing, it's interesting, and you'll, you'll see why. From a conceptual and a philosophical and an intellectual point of view, how one offers an email or a blog post or an Internet cache file into evidence, lays a foundation for it, is absolutely fascinating. And my background before I uh, became a technology compliance lawyer was I was a trial lawyer for more than uh, uh, 25 years, starting in criminal law and working my way through pharmaceutical and mechanical product liability, constitutional law, commercial litigation and the like, and I'm very familiar with the challenges of putting anything into evidence laying a foundation for it, if you will, and doing that with something that is intangible is much, much more difficult than a tangible object. The other thing is, while some of you may be thinking, well, heck, why do we need this? Not much goes to trial anymore. Most cases are disposed of by motion, summary judgment motion, directed verdict uh, once a case has started. And those applications have to be backed by... Uh, and proof in admissible form, we'll be talking about a case called Lorraine v. Markell, where both sides uh, made cross motions for summary judgment using printouts of emails in support, but with no other foundational information. And Judge Paul Grimm, recently appointed to the District Court of Maryland, but at the time of that case a magistrate judge, said in effect, what am I to do with these pieces of paper that no one has told me what they are? How do you authenticate a printout of an email? Well, no attempt was made, and both motions were denied, with both sides having spent hundreds of thousands of dollars and having gotten absolutely nothing. Paul Grimm said very famously in that decision and in a subsequent law review article that the failure to admit electronic evidence that one has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to get is nothing short of a self-inflicted wound. So on that happy note, let's move on. These are headlines that one sees on a fairly frequent basis with regard to how serious information governance compliance is. Um, the Alaska Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Health and Social Services, having been fined $1.7 million for uh, da data breaches. Um, we see every week there are new forms of data, uh, data breach from the healthcare industry. Hacking is a multinational business concern. Hacking of law firms is becoming a very big deal. It's been said of physicians, and I spent uh, a large part of my career in healthcare, that they are lousy business people. And uh, it's also true to a great extent of lawyers, but I'm going to take it one step further and tell you that most lawyers are terrible when it comes to information security. And law firms here in New York City, where I practice, are being hacked at an alarming rate by foreign governments because uh, those law firms are involved in mergers and acquisitions, for example, that involve core state industries in places like Russia uh, and, and China. So a lot of these actors do indeed uh, con uh, constitute nations, but they also constitute politically motivated groups. How many of you have heard of the hacking recently by the group Anonymous? where they then leave little Guy Fawkes masks on people's screens after they, they've hacked in. Uh, people who were involved with WikiLeaks, for example, or the prosecution of Private Manning um, and uh, Julian Assange have been particularly uh, frequent targets of Anonymous. There is hacking by business rivals. Cyber espionage lives. Uh, and we, we see it from time to time. Recently, an FBI uh, agent came to New York to speak to a group of law firms about their uh, protections or, or lack thereof uh, and, and mentioned, mentioned this, that uh, there have been a number of invasions and intrusions uh, into law firm and corporate firewalls 
this is a this is a very big deal. Uh, also, a lot of the security breaches that you will see are not the virus invasion kind or the hacking kind. A lot of them are just flat out pure failure to take good precautions, otherwise known as negligence. Um, in in healthcare, and I do a lot of work in HIPAA compliance. I am HIPAA compliance counsel to hospitals, software developers for health electronic health information, and law firms that uh, work with information because uh, they are HIPAA business associates, and under the new HIPAA omnibus rule and the High Tech Act, they are responsible for following the security rule uh, of HIPAA and are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Health and Human Services, or if Health and Human Services declines to prosecute, they can, uh, state attorneys general can bring a HIPAA violation action against a covered entity, a hospital or a health plan, or a business associate, a consultancy, an e-discovery vendor, a law firm, even most recently a cloud computing services uh, uh, provider. So you can imagine where a state attorney general, having had a quiet week, uh, finds that there have been some uh, fairly significant breaches in his or her state and decides to take action. Richard Blumenthal did that when he was attorney general of Connecticut. The attorney general of Illinois uh, brought a couple of actions uh, as well, and there are others, I'm sure, that are percolating around the country I don't know about. Uh, for healthcare, though, the most of the breaches that one sees fall into these categories, and you're going to see a recurring theme here. A laptop stolen out of somebody's car or briefcase where the doctor or nurse or executive has downloaded a number of medical charts and didn't encrypt the data. HIPAA requires that electronic information be encrypted at rest and in transmission. This is a blunt, old-faced, with an asterisk, HIPAA violation. Or loss of USB drives. We all know how tiny those things can be and how many gigs they can hold. Most people don't encrypt the information in their USB drives. You lose one, guess what? It's a breach of information. And under the new uh, high tech, uh, I'm sorry, under the new HIPAA omnibus rule, there is no longer a, require, a reporting requirement that there be a significant risk of harm. That's the old requirement. The new one is a risk of harm is presumed, presumed, unless the covered entity or the business associate can show why there is no particular risk of harm. This is an interesting one. The third bullet, a cloud service uh, provider. A uh, cardiology office in Phoenix, Arizona, was using a cloud service provider for its appointments calendar. Um, Nothing intrinsically wrong with that as long as you don't do what these folks did, which is have it available on the Internet without a password. So all the names of all the patients were now visible. Uh, they received a fine well into the six figures as a settlement from the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, Office of Civil Rights, which is the entity that enforces HIPAA. But that's not the big ticket item. The expensive item for this service, for this uh, medical practice, is they have to do compliance monitoring and compliance reports to DHHS and remediation uh, for a, a few years. And that's what's going to cost double, if not triple, what those fines were. The fourth bullet is another interesting one that is affecting corporations too, but you didn't see it in healthcare until fairly recently, viruses. This hospital in Georgia, uh, was infected with a virus that caused the electronic health record system to lock up to the point where they had to send the patient, all the non-emergency patients to other hospitals. And here's how it happened. A physician uh, wanted to finish his uh, charts, his electronic charts, so he looked, downloaded them into a USB drive and took the USB drive home, plugged it into his home computer. Well, unbeknownst to him, one of his teenage kids had clicked on the wrong attachment at home and the thing was infected with a virus, which then, of course, infected his USB. Well, you can imagine what comes next. He went back to the hospital, plugged in the USB into the uh, hospital network, and the whole thing seized up. So 
Um, when I write the uh, protocols for uh, hospitals and physicians' offices, I make it quite clear, and I recommend this as a best practice, that no USB drive be used that has not been inspected and approved by, uh, by IT, and that that USB drive have uh, uh, encryption and be capable of password protection. There are legal, uh, cybersecurity is not just a business obligation, it's a legal obligation. And you see here the list of some of the statutes and regulations that actually have requirements for certain levels of security. Um, and if, make no mistake, if, there is, if you're in one of these industries, finance, for Sarbanes, uh, for Sarbanes, Oxley, um, uh, for uh, medical, for HIPAA, um, or for any industry, for that matter, in the state of Massachusetts that uh, has personal information that needs to be protected, um, if there's a violation, the government is going to do a retrospective analysis, which is what, what were your precautions and what were your safeguards? How well did you document them? When is the last time you trained people on them? All right, there is no requirement for perfection. Anybody can be hacked. Anybody can be the, the victim of a breach. Lord knows the highest government levels have been. S corporations like RSA, which make security tools, has been hacked. Cisco has been hacked. Cisco is hosting this WebEx. Don't worry, I'm sure this has been uh, vetted perfectly fine. But the point being that uh, perfection is not the requirement. Reasonable steps for safeguards is the requirement. There's also a legal benefit for security practices, which is that it can make your life easier if you have good security protocols when you go to offer this electronic information into evidence. Authentication and chain of custody being two examples. We'll get to that at the end of my portion of the presentation when we talk about uh, admissibility. All right, healthcare. Why is all information going to be electronic by 2015? Because the High Tech Act, Act said it would be. $27 billion was allotted in incentive payments to move the country to a fully interoperable electronic health record system. That's the carrot. The stick is that if it's not done by 2015, if you are not a Medicare or Medicaid patient, uh, Medicare or Medicaid patient, think about how many hospitals can survive without Medicare or Medicaid, and the answer is going to be very few. Uh, if you haven't gone electronic in compliance with what is called the Meaningful Use Rule, which sets out the standards for compliance in electronic health information in healthcare, your Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements will be cut, but that's not all. The year to become compliant is 2013, right now, because the judge, the metric for compliance in 2015 will be a two-year look back to 2013. The government will look to see how compliant you were in this year so before they decide whether to assess penalties and cuts. So the bottom line for any of you in healthcare who are, who are out there, this is the year you must be compliant. This is the year you must meet the standards of meaningful use rule and high tech. Next year, uh, the Affordable Care Act, colloquial, colloquially known as Obamacare, kicks in. Section 1104 of the Affordable Care Act requires all information on eligibility uh, for insurance to be in electronic form. Imagine there's going to be 40 million new people coming in uh, to the health care system uh, in the next year who were previously uninsured, and you get an idea of why this is a bit of a nightmare to corporations, and yet this is an opportunity for uh, consultancies, uh, vendors, and, and law firms to help make this a much smoother transition. And those of us involved in this area are uh, working to do exactly that through uh, sessions like this, through articles, through blog posts, and the like. Now, the HIPAA omnibus rule came out only a uh, few months ago, January 13th, and. January 17th, and what it did is it expanded, expanded, if you could believe that, the high-tech requirements to uh, breach, for breach notification and other aspects of compliance and extended jurisdiction to business associates, as I've talked about, those who access health information on a regular basis 
billers, coders, law firms, IT vendors, electronic discovery com uh, consultancies like Xilab, and their subcontractors in turn. There are new provisions for written agreements that uh, state, in effect, that the business associate and the subcontractor will keep information secure and will keep it private according to these rules. And there's a reduced standard, as I mentioned before, for reportable, reportable breaches. Oops, let me go back one. There we go. So some of the hot issues in, in e-discovery for healthcare. Number one is audit trails. And audit trail is a kind of, um, is a type of metadata mandated by HIPAA. What an audit trail does is it tells uh, the, the reader who has looked at the electronic medical record and at what time and what he or she did with it. Um, we are seeing here in New York, and we do a lot of healthcare work, that in employment cases and professional discipline cases, government investigations, and medical malpractice cases, um, the requesting parties are looking for audit trails first and foremost. Why? Because it's an objective standard for who looked, what did you know, and when did you know it? Um, again, as a trial lawyer, this is something I've always wanted to know. So it's a, it's a hot item. Native format production, uh, the record looks very different on the screen than it looks when it is printed out. We're seeing a lot of requests for native format production, particularly for radiology images. Um, electronic communications, even though it's not necessary, many people don't think emails and texts are part of the record, they are for purposes of a court. If doctors are talking with each other or talking with nurses or technicians or other clinicians about medical care, it's going to be part of the record, just as if they were writing paper memos. And, they, and I don't know any court that won't necessarily hold that. So query, where are your emails? How easily can they be retrieved? On what network are they? Uh, what I counsel my hospital clients to do is to have a protocol that no communications about patients are going to be on an application other than the hospital network. First of all, it's a HIPAA violation to communicate protected health information over unencrypted media. But more importantly, from a litigation point of view, is if you've got people communicating on Gmail, Hotmail, um, AOL, people still do that, um, Verizon, uh, how are you possibly going to collect all this information and preserve it as the law requires? Also, finally, off-the-grid applications. A lot of hospitals create their information systems the way they create their physical plants. There's, they start off with a small core built many, many years ago, and then they add on wings. They add on wings. Or here they add on applications, and they add on systems, and they add on platforms. Sometimes laboratories or departments will go out and buy their own imaging systems and information applications and don't tell anybody about them. We've had the situation here where we've come into uh, a deposition with a record, and it turns out the plaintiff has a much thicker record than we do because he or she were able to get the record from their client who in turn got it through calling the actual physician who went to the off-the-grid application and picked it up. A data map is critical, particularly in healthcare, to show what you have, where you have it, how easily you can access it. Without that, you may not be able to meet the legal requirements in, in court actions about producing documents or government uh, requests for that matter for investigation. Okay, let's move on from healthcare to international, the global march of data. Several challenges here. First of all, information is being uh, sent around and stored and created in many, many countries at the same time. Yet, by the same token, the, the blurring of political borders is being met by a hardening of political borders. Uh, as I'll get to in a moment, the European Union and most of the rest of the world has a general principle that you can't send personal data outside either the region or the country without consent of the data subject. What is personal data? Personal data is, according to Article 2 of the European Union Privacy Directives, data that can be traced to an identifiable person. I'm not being glib. That's actually what it says. So you can imagine how difficult this can be when you have a U.S. judge or the Department of Justice or the SEC saying to you, produce the data in 30 days, and you've got someone in Italy saying, but judge, that's a problem, that um, 
violates Italian privacy law unless we go through certain treaty procedures like the Hague Convention on the taking of evidence abroad. I actually once had a client say to me, I'll never forget this, um, when I told him that we had an order compelling the production of uh, emails between Italian executives going back four years and pr pr produce it in the U.S. within 30 days, he said to me, Mr. Rashbaum, in which country do you prefer I go to jail in first? And he was not the first client I asked that and won't be the last. There are data protection laws in 85 countries and growing every day, Singapore being the most, the most recent one. The consequences for U.S. corporations are obvious because sending data around for information governance purposes also requires compliance with these laws. Very important. So, but what companies can do is be proactive, take advantage of the fact that they now have some warning that these laws exist and that they can organize their information transfer and information governance protocols, retention schedules, and the like ahead of the process server, ahead of the government inquiry, and then it will be much easier to handle this for any discovery or litigation uh, purpose. The European, let me just give you the general scheme of the European Union, and then I'll talk about some of the differences for Asia, South America, uh, and Canada. You, some of you may have attended these international e-discovery sessions and thought, oh my God, this is so Eurocentric, there's a whole world out there beyond Europe. You know what? You're right. And I'm going to try not to do that, but I am going to lay the foundation for this by starting with the European Union because most countries have based their uh, rules on the European Union privacy directives and a little known fact, HIPAA, our, our health privacy law, is loosely based on the European Union privacy directives. The privacy directives are a floor, a minimum standard, just like HIPAA is a minimum standard for healthcare protection here. Each country implements the privacy directive. Remember, 27 member states in the European Union. Each country implements the directives with its own legislation, but they can't go below the standard, the privacy standard, but they can go above it, and most of them do. Second aspect you see mostly in Europe, but also in Quebec and South Africa, are blocking statutes. France's blocking statute is the most famous one. That prohibits the export of any data, not just personal data, any data, for use in a foreign judicial proceeding. The French prosecute violations, so do the Swiss. I haven't seen one from Quebec yet, but it wouldn't surprise me, and I certainly don't want my client to be the first. The privacy directives are being revised this year. The goal is to set up one set of data protection and privacy laws for all 27 member states. Given the recent experience with the Eurozone, I'm not exactly sure whether this is going to fly in its current form, but from what I've seen, it probably will. Fines can go up to 2% of the corporation's annual income. Imagine that. Their recent privacy laws have been enacted on similar principles. In Korea and Singapore, Mexico passed a privacy law a couple of years ago, but just passed its, re its enforcing regulations. And I'm told by my colleagues in Mexico that they are looking for scalps. They are looking for um, particularly American companies, but also European companies who violate the law to make examples of. Don't let your client or your company be the first. China has no overarching privacy law, but it does have a series of statutes, and the most uh, di uh, dangerous one is the Protection of State Secrets Law, because what that says is that um, information China considers to be a state secret can't be exported out of the country. Well, in the Rio Tinto case involving the Australian company uh, Rio Tinto Mining in 2010, Mining information was sent to Australia, and the Chinese government prosecuted and imprisoned, imprisoned, talk about real-world consequences, people who had sent those data. The thing I, right now, between the interests of time, that I want to stress about Canada is there is a federal law, and there are also provincial statutes. PEPIDA is the overarching federal law, Personal Information, Privacy, and Electronic Data Act. But the, the provinces can and do go further. British Columbia, for example, prohibits storage of personal data in cloud service repositories in the United States because of concerns about the Patriot Act. Now, 
How, is, how does this come into play with e-discovery? Well, imagine the conflict, if you will, between a U.S. court saying, I want the data now, and my Italian client who said, I can't give it to you because I'm going to go to jail. Also, preservation on Zuba Lake and similar cases may violate local laws. There is an opinion from the European Commission, Article 29, Working uh, Party on Data Protection, which states that a litigation hold simply for reasons of reasonable anticipation of litigation may violate European law. Well, that's exactly the language of the Zubalay cases and pension committee, so what are you supposed to do? What you do is work with counsel who are knowledgeable in this area, both local and otherwise, to narrow the scope of the legal hold. Now, courts are required under the Aerospatial against District Court of Iowa case to use a five-factor balancing test to consider whether to uh, whether to uh, utilize uh, foreign law, particularly foreign data privacy law. But as a practical matter, they rarely do. They give lip service to it, but don't. So what you need to do if you're representing a company like that, and I get brought in especially discovery counsel in these areas, <coughs> is to bring the issues up as early as you can, certainly at the Rule 26F conference, but at, at a minimum at the Article 16 conference. And most of the judges with whom I speak on panels, and I've also taught this course, International E-Discovery, at the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, uniformly say if they know there's an issue early on, they can provide for extra time in the discovery schedule or issue letters rogatory under the Hague Convention to try to get the information. But if they don't get told about it until the 29th day of a 30-day order, they will react very, very negatively. Now, the ABA is trying to take steps on this by uh, passing ABA Resolution 103 of last year, which urges U.S. courts to consider and respect as appropriate data privacy laws that affect the litigants before them. This is a big deal because uh, parties can now point to this resolution and it has the full force and backing of the ABA. The other point on this I'm going to leave you with is before any collection takes place in the European Union, it's necessary to cull and filter the data, and this is again out of a working party, uh, Article 29 working party opinions, for sensitive and irrelevant data. You need to come up with culling protocols based on the statute for what constitutes sensitive data, which is usually health care, religion, sexual orientation, but also political and labor union affiliation, varies by country, and also relevance issues in which you'll need counsel to go over the uh, uh, government request or the uh, papers in the lawsuit and uh, define the issues and come up with a culling protocol for that. And yes, you need to do it in the local language. I actually had a firm that brought me in, especially Discovery Council, when I told them we had an associate here who's fluent in German and the case was in Germany. They said, why do we need that? I actually had to say, ask them, well, where's the data from and what's the language of the people who created it? Last point is admissibility. Um, again, use what you have created. The foundation for admission of any documentary evidence is authentication. Uh, is it what you say it is? Reliability. Is it created and maintained in a way that you can rely on it, that it has integrity, it hasn't been altered? And finally, business exception rules, to, uh, exceptions to the hearsay rule. You have to meet all those things, plus, of course, relevance. Um, without much time to go into that, I put a citation here to the article that I and my co-authors wrote uh, on admissibility of non-U.S. electronic evidence. We lay out very clearly how one, for example, without bringing in live witnesses from a place like Lithuania, can uh, get a Lithuanian blog post or text or email into evidence in, the, in a United States court. Consider then that the security protocols, if you will, can make the chain of custody easier. Things like distinguishing characteristics can be used to authenticate. Uh, sometimes expert, uh, expert testimony from someone like Johannes, for example, can be absolutely critical in trying to show why this information meets the standards of foundation to get it admitted into, into evidence. Documentation of information governance protocols, how information is retained, kept, secured from place to place to place 
can help you get this information into evidence and make sure that if you're offering it, you're prepared to meet these objections. You can't do this on the fly. You've got to prepare in court for a judge who may not be that familiar with how electronic evidence uh, is, is received so that he or she can be educated by you as counsel in order to get this information into evidence. Mary? Oh, that is a fantastic overview, Ken. Thank you. And I would highly recommend Ken's law review article that he has cited on this slide, uh, the admissibility of non-U.S. evidence in uh, the in the jolt of uh, uh, Richmond. Uh, Jan is going to speak about some of the technical approaches to to handling this conundrum that, that Ken has, has put out in uh, front of us. How, how can a corporation or a law firm handling uh, sensitive data do it and do it cost-effectively and with the least amount of risk? Jan? Yeah, Mary, thank you uh, very much. And uh, I also want to share my compliments to Ken. A very, very clear uh, overview of uh, some very complex uh, uh, matters and uh, very well explained and um, and also uh, yeah, I would like to continue now and, 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 and explain how technology can help uh, separating and sorting and classifying all these different data in all these different languages in all these different locations often you know completely outside of your control such as cloud locations and, and, and all the other uh, great examples that uh, can provide it with and to make it uh, very simple, uh, this is uh, what we see now is this is what people, uh, what our clients uh, would like to do. They want to find data which is compliant to some kind of privacy act, which can be HIPAA or any of the other acts Ken mentioned. Uh, you want to find data which is under legal hold, and uh, from what I uh, just learned, is uh, you have to be careful with it as well. Uh, you may want to find obsolete data, irrelevant data. Uh, you may want to find data that's relevant or responsive or, or data that may contain uh, some knowledge. And this is really uh, where technology can help because we're not on our own here. Uh, of course, we can try to review everything manually, but believe me, that's not going to work. And what I show you here are some very simple, straightforward examples of how with, with, with technology such as iLab provides, you can, for instance, recognize client project documentation. Uh, you can search for, I want to have all the documents that contain at least one of the following terms, uh, which uh, has to be statement within three uh, words of work, uh, SOW, functional design, RFI, et cetera, et cetera. This is what we call a quorum search. You can also increase this one uh, there in the front to two or three, which uh, increases your precision and with by extending the number of words between the brackets, you can increase your recall. Uh, and this is effectively a very uh, strong, a very uh, powerful method to uh, find very high precision and recall. Uh, also, anybody familiar with LexisNexis or any other legal search will also immediately recognize the, the, the syntax of the query. Uh, we've tried to maintain it as much as possible, the same as the legal uh, syntax and that lawyers are familiar with. Um, th there's a lot of ways to find uh, information that leads to a individual, as Ken stated it, uh, or confidential information or, or other personal information. You can search for login information for passwords. Uh, you can use wildcards, which is the asterisk here. You can search for personal documents like driver and licenses. We even have some recent technology, unfortunately, I didn't put it in here yet, uh, where we can even search for pictures of IDs and pictures of driver licenses, and the computer will recognize that these type of pictures are in there. Um, and we use that, uh, we use visual search technology for that. We can find credit card numbers by using what we call in computer science regular expressions. And it looks maybe a little bit intimidating, but these kind of regular expressions allow you to find anything of a format. Uh, which resembles a credit card or a social security number or a bank account number, et cetera, et cetera. We can also take this a little bit more uh, to more more higher level where, for instance, we're going to search for work privilege, uh, work product privilege, attorney-client privilege, uh, physician-patient uh, privilege, all the examples that, that Ken just provided, uh, we can search for 
names of attorneys, names of physicians. We can search for email addresses. Uh, we can use any of the original text and information in, in a document, but also the traffic information, the, the meta information, the, the document properties, the file properties, anything uh, to search this type of uh, data. Um, as Ken indicated, it's very important to be able to support different languages. Now, in our software, we support, uh, I think the last uh, count was uh, 440 uh, different languages, um, including you know all of the major languages like Chinese, traditional and modern, but also Korean, uh, French, uh, including, as you can see here, the accent aigu and the accent grave, uh, German and, and Russian and many, many other different languages. We can use exactly the same type of queries in these other languages. Now, what we do is that, that we have a very uh, easy to understand and, 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 and easy to use interface where uh, we can actually find custodians, we can find permit numbers, we can find uh, codes, we can find social security numbers. And by using color coding and hit highlighting, we can highlight all of these different uh, terms. Uh, we can extract them, uh, we can export them to databases and spreadsheets for further analysis. Uh, but most important, we can identify them. And once you have identified them, uh, that's when you can take uh, different actions. Now, a lot of uh, information breaches occur when information has been misplaced unwillingly or unknowingly uh, in a computer system. And this is where we see that most uh, CIOs and IT managers uh, see the value of this type of technology these days. They they want to know what's out there. They want to run software, they want to monitor their file shares, their SharePoint servers, their email servers, and monitor it for potentially uh, personal identifiable information or potentially confidential documents or, or secret documents or uh, any type of document that should be encrypted, that should be somewhere behind, you know, a safe firewall, that should be somewhere deep down in the database, very hard to access. Uh, but for whatever reason, because somebody made a mistake or somebody didn't pay any attention, is now somewhere on an unencrypted, non-encrypted, uh, open file share accessible for everybody, including your, uh, including all of the students and, and, and maybe people even, you know, outside there uh, who can access your data without even having to enter a password. Now, with this type of technology, you can identify that information, and then you can very quickly uh, present statistics, uh, like in this case, uh, where are documents that probably have a certain security level on this and this share or in this and this file server. And um, and then what you can immediately see is go to these documents, open them, and then say, okay, is this truly a violation or is it not? And then before things go wrong, you, you can take active uh, uh, measurements and proactive measurements and, and, and prevent any problems. Very important in 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 in, in e discovery are uh, and is in disclosure is also redaction. Uh, I have an example here of a UK freedom of information exemption code. Uh, in our software, we also have other exemption codes from US uh, exemption codes, European exemption codes. Uh, there's there's many reasons that. Um, uh, require or that allow you to uh, redact and anonymize information. Now, because we can automatically recognize these type of uh, patterns, uh, uh, we can redact them, but what we can also do is we can also allow users to manually add them. Uh, what you see here in this redaction is that you can also put some text there. Uh, you, you can put some text over the uh, original text, and we also have made it very easy to review redactions and, and do a whole workflow that makes the addition and, and, and the entering of redactions a much less costly process. Here are some other great examples of like redactions uh, of documents that are like in multiple directions. This text, uh, if you can see it, is actually in different directions. This is straightforward. This is upside down. This is landscape uh, one direction and landscape or uh, landscape in the other direction. And um, yeah, the, we can recognize and search and, and, and redact everything. Here you see a great example of some Korean text, uh, where the Korean text can not only be searched, but it can also, as you can see here, be, be redacted. Like foreign language is, is absolutely uh, not an issue for, for our technology. And here are some examples of, of intelligent redactions where we can use either keywords or 
uh, gazetteers or, or regular expressions or other technology or rules or, or artificial intelligence type of pattern recognition to identify uh, all kinds of different uh, personal identifiable information, like here in German, Frau, Herr, uh, Madame, you know, different, all kinds of other different uh, ways to recognize this. Uh, we can not only, do, one of the other things that's more and more important in uh, litigation is also drawings. And, um, and and schematics, uh, not only in, in construction industry, but also in a variety of, of other technology industries. Uh, we can also search and, and redact and, 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 and analyze this type of documents, and it's really uh, not a problem to, to work with these ones uh, as well. Uh, this is just a couple of examples of how our technology helps our clients worldwide uh, managing and automatically classifying and sorting information and, and one of the key added value uh, of our technology is that as Ken indicated there's a lot of jurisdictions that have uh, uh, rules and regulations that are in contradiction of each other and uh, you don't want to pay fines uh, in different contradictions while at the same time trying to be you know as good as you can, and then you do everything that they want in the U.S., and suddenly you get a huge fine in France, and the, or the other way around. Now, with our technology, we allow our users to limit those risks to the absolute minimum. Uh, so, so we allow them to, to, to find documents that are potentially leading to persons or individuals that are potentially containing any PII um, and that may violate local um, data protection uh, violations. On the other hand, we can also find all the other documents that may be relevant and, uh, and because of our technology is used on both sides of the pond as well in Europe by some of the most private, privately sensitive organizations, even in France, uh, one of our clients, uh, for instance, is the French Senate. Some of the other clients uh, that we have are the European um, anti-fraud offices that are under very, very strict uh, data protection requirements and very strict privacy rules. And the reason why they use our technology is because our technology allows them to do investigations and allows them to to, uh, to analyze data, but at the same time uh, respect European uh, privacy regulations and data protection. On the other hand, we have a lot of clients in the U.S. that use our software for, for e-discovery under the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. So we are one of the few vendors that understand both requirements and that also allow our, our clients to use uh, our technology to be as compliant as possible with both uh, regulations and it's very important that uh, if you do um, uh, negotiate your protocols and I think this is where where Mary and Ken uh, probably have uh, you know have absolutely have much more experience than I have uh, this is what you should take into consideration uh, because if you are uh, willing to to be compliant with as many legislations as, as as you can you have to negotiate how you're going to do that uh, and you have to reach agreement as soon as possible in the e-discovery process and then it's very useful if you understand that this technology is out there and uh, you can actually be compliant with uh, with different uh, jurisdictions or regis legislations okay mary thank you very much up to you yeah th thanks Jan. we've got some questions um uh, one of the questions uh, is uh, that we have somebody who's pursuing a certificate in e-discovery and wants to know what steps an e-discovery manager can take to make sure that he or she has ample knowledge about data protection in order to perform his or her job as a proficient e-discovery manager. And certainly this, this uh, webinar is one step. And then Ken and Jan, um, I know, Jan, you've got some things from AIM, and uh, Ken, you've got your... Um, You've got some things uh, as well uh, from uh, Sedona and other places? Yeah, there are a number of uh, different places uh, that, that you can go, but my suggestion is twofold. One is in an e-discovery matter that spans countries, you need outside counsel. You need to have someone who is proficient in not only the laws of the different jurisdictions, but how they apply to the transfers and how do they apply to the to the business uses of the information, where it's been, where it's going to go, where uh, what the data map is, and how it's ultimately how it's ultimately going to use. Anybody can read the statute, 
but when it comes to figuring out how to comply with it in a way that gets the job done, that's where you need somebody who's got experience in that area because take it from my own personal experience, it's not a good answer to a federal judge in the United States or a Department of Justice investigator to say, sorry, I can't give it to you. Privacy law says no. So you have to work with people who can figure out a way to do it. In these instances, I put together a team with outside counsel, in-house counsel, the IT department, and representatives of the business users who are, whose information will be involved here. Also, uh, Mary mentioned the Sedona Conference. There's a, a paper that's available for a free download called uh, the Sedona Conference Framework for Analysis of Cross-Border Data Conflicts, Data Discovery Conflicts. Uh, like I said, it's a free download. I would very strongly recommend it to you. And I think it, it's important to know what questions to ask. Um, and uh, if you're an e-discovery manager and dealing with technology people, you'll need to you'll need to know what the issues are. You may not know what the answers are yet, but to know what the issues are. And as Ken said, uh, having outside counsel that is on the ground in the country uh, or an e-discovery provider that has experience in the jurisdiction that you're working, uh, that that's what's going to um, train you on how to do it. Um, and then, of course, with all of the changes, you need to keep updated on these things. That's right. There are synergies between the technical people, the legal people, and the business people. And by taking advantage of these synergies, you can best do your job as a proficient e-discovery manager. It's not siloed. This really is a holistic uh, endeavor. Yeah, so can we have a question on the on the uh, you, you mentioned that you uh, that you're not sure if the data protection laws are are going to are going to pass, but there's been some rumblings about the safe harbor and the binding corporate rules. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, sure. The uh, one of the provisions for well, let me back up for a second. Remember, I mentioned the general rule is that personal data can't be sent outside the European Union. It's actually the European Economic Area, which includes. Uh, Iceland, Norway, um, Switzerland, uh, the, the Channel Islands as well, uh, without either consent or without certain safeguards being in effect if, if you're sending it to a country that doesn't have commensurate levels of data protection. There are only a few countries the EU considers to have commensurate levels, and the U.S. is not one of them. They are Canada, Argentina, um, Switzerland, Israel, um, and uh, and Uruguay. So if you're not in one of those countries, you need to have uh, some safeguards in place, either by data transfer agreements between entities in the different countries, which have model clauses recognized by the European Union, or if it's going to the United States, to the uh, subscription to the United States uh, Chamber of Commerce Safe Harbor Program, which has a number of principles there as well. Or finally, Binding corporate rules, which are, in effect, corporate codes, global codes of conduct with those information uh, safeguards uh, built in. I see there's another question as well, Mary. Uh, yes, go ahead, Ken. Uh, Bob, you, it, if you want. Uh, this is a question that says, why not encrypt all the data that you have in your system? Trying to do so trying to do only certain files is very difficult. Well, that's a good point, but again, you know, at the end of the day, Xilab and my law firm and, and people like, like us are here to uh, facilitate the global flow of business. We're not here to inhibit that, although sometimes it may seem that way, but that's not how I view my mandate. I don't think Mary views hers that way either. If you encrypt all the data you have, well, the, it, that may not be very practical because, uh, depending on who you're sending, not all data has to be encrypted, all right? Not everything needs to be encrypted. And remember, the recipient's got to have the encryption key. If you can set that up within your corporate network and it's small enough so that everybody has an encryption key or you're using an application, I know, for example, Cisco has one called the registered envelope, where uh, where you can do it easily enough, and whoever downloads it has to put in a password, and then that's, in effect, the decryption key, great. Then you can do that. 
it all depends on your business culture, your business organization, and your business purpose as to whether that's practical for you or not. There is no legal requirement that all data in all industries must be encrypted. It's industry by industry and country by country. And but then there, and in addition to that, there will always be information uh, which is unintendedly not encrypted because Windows or or Mac uh, OS uh, makes all kind of buffers. Uh, there there's all kind of temp files that are stored. So uh, there will always be some kind of of unintended, uh, uh, unanticipated copy of of data which may contain personal identifiable information and and um and, and that's also something to take into consideration and it, you don't need to be a forensic accountant to find that information because often it's just in you know open uh windows uh operating system directories and unfortunately it's very hard to even encrypt those directories you can only encrypt specially designated data directories uh, so you always, and of course, what you say, Ken, with when you communicate information from one location to the other one, what we also see a lot is that we, we have many clients in the law enforcement uh, space, and they have these networks that use encrypted lines, and, and by definition, encrypted lines are much slower than non-encrypted lines. Uh, so uh, it could very well be that uh, if you're going to use encrypted information, you need to um, put a lot of money in uh, upgrading your your landlines and other communication lines to uh, often a multitude of uh, the actual capacity that you need, because uh, we we see effectively that even a T1 line can be reduced to a 64 kilobit line if you're going to use uh, a very strong encryption standard. That's a great yeah that's that that's a great point. Um, also different, you know, where, where encryption is required, there are different standards for what that encryption may be, 120, 128 bit, 256-bit. Um, and again, this is something that needs to be reviewed. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So this points out the the uh, uh, the necessity to take a, to actually take a look and make an assessment of what kinds of information, what kind of statutes, what kind of jurisdictions that a company is in and what standards of data handling are applicable. And I thank, I thank you, Jan, and I thank you, uh, Ken. Thank you very much for, uh, for laying all of this out. Um, we will be uh, sending a communication to attendees and posting the website, or the, the website, the uh, webcast, uh, for those of you who would like to uh, refresh your notes. Um, thank you very much. And Diana? All right, thank you so much to our presenters, and ladies and gentlemen, this does conclude today's event. We really appreciate your time and participation. You may disconnect. Have a great rest of your day. Bye.